I'm not the type, with exceptions, when it comes to women. I know, I know. In fact, aren't most men not the type when it comes to women? I know, some of us think we know about them, that we understand them, but is that really true? I think not. Like most men, I'm just trying to figure things out and do everything as right as I can. Having said that, I suppose it's for this very reason that it took me so long to understand that I truly am the type when it comes to women and, in particular, my wife. I saw signs of her indifference and infidelity for almost five months before I decided that if there's smoke, maybe there's just a fire that I need to extinguish. As the old song goes, we got married in a fever, hotter than a pepper sprout. I found Catherine, courted her, and married her during one year of college. I was studying at the University of Oklahoma in Stillwater, majoring in event management, when she happened into my life. All right, all right. My actual specialty was hotel and restaurant management. Parties were what I did when I should have been studying that I also worked as a bouncer at a well-known and popular place on campus. Bouncers rotated positions throughout the building to perform their duties. We served visitors at the doors, checking documents, and weaved through the crowd to make sure nothing untoward happened. There was a balcony in the bar, and one of us always kept watch from the top of the staircase landing to prevent drunken falls while I was working there, I quickly gained an understanding of the representatives of the female gender. I learned which ones were suitable, which were not, and which sometimes were, and how to identify each of them. When I occupied the post at the top of the stairs, I had a view of a large part of the lower floor. From my post on the balcony, I observed how women handled the types of men on the first floor. Some women, with two or three poor souls in tow, bought drinks for them simultaneously in hopes of escorting them home or to their cars to spend a little more time in a secluded corner later in the evening. Many young ladies would solicit drinks from the types of men shortly before closing time. Usually, after the last call or slightly before, there was a mass exodus of these women. They pretended to head to the restroom before leaving with a young man who had been treating them throughout the evening, allowing them to slip out through the back door, which led from the corridor to the bathrooms. This, of course, frustrated the men, and many times one of the bouncers had to give them advice to calm them down. I knew which of the young women regularly played these games, and as a public servant, I would warn my friends, and sometimes just a guy I found decent and who didn't deserve to be spoken ill of. Others, I simply allowed to be entertained. However, one Saturday evening after a home game, I was working and observed how drunkards made fools of themselves when that absolute goddess fell into my arms. Drunk is putting it mildly for her. She was completely out of it and claimed she didn't even know where she was. She couldn't find the friend she presumably came with, but I understood that. I had never seen her with these women before, and they were one of the worst groups who could sneak out through the back door after drinking free all night. I was almost certain they had left. It was after the last call, and they usually bolted when the last call was announced, around this time, when Catherine literally hung on my arm, a man approached, the one she had been soliciting drinks from. He looked aggressively at me and grabbed her by the arm. Come on, Kelly, he said. We need to get out of here. I was starting to think you'd vanished because of me. Well, it seems I now know her name. I was about to let her go with the young man when she came to her senses a bit and looked at him questioningly. My name is not Kelly, it's Catherine. Who are you? Why should I go with you? Where's Cindy and the other girls? I was supposed to go with them when the bar closes. The man simply pulled her by the arm and said, Kelly, Catherine, it doesn't matter. I've been buying you drinks all night, and now you're coming home with me. Catherine regained her senses and attempted to stand up and push the man away. She looked bewildered and said, eh no. I don't know you and don't want to go with you. Now, leave me alone. The man tried to drag her away again, but she resisted. I decided she truly didn't know him and didn't want to leave, so I pulled her towards the bar and tried to stand between them. Hey, buddy, I said. Looks like the lady doesn't want to go with you. 
So why don't you just leave, as she asked, before we have a problem. A mask of hatred appeared on his face, and he shoved me. Back off, jerk. This chick is with me, and we're leaving. And now drop it, if you know what's good for you. I stepped back a bit, then grabbed him by the arms and swiftly spun him around, pinning him against the wall. He yelled in pain as one of my bouncer colleagues approached. You got trouble, Dave. Nope. This guy wanted to take the lady with him, but she didn't want to go. He didn't want to take no for an answer, but I think he understands now, doesn't he? Saying this, I pulled the troublemaker's arms a little further up, and he cried out in pain and rose onto his tiptoes. Oh, yeah, I get it. Just let me go, man. I escorted the man to the door and stepped out onto the edge of the sidewalk that I gently pushed him and said, All right, buddy, get lost. We've got your picture now, so I don't want any more trouble from you. Otherwise, next time we'll have to call security. I returned to the building and saw a couple of waitresses gathered around Catherine. She had passed out right in her chair. Damn, just what I was afraid of, Patty looked at me and said, Dave, Catherine lives in my dorm. If you help me get her back to the dorm and settle her into her room, I can take care of her from there. Well, that's what I did, and that's how I became one of Catherine's favorite people. The following weekend, I was working on a Friday night when a beautiful woman bounded up to me, wrapped her arms around me, and planted a very sloppy and long kiss on my cheek before I could react that I pushed her away and said, Wow, what's all this about? You saved me last Saturday. Patty told me you stopped that jerk from taking me home, then you drove us back to the dorm and helped her get me into my room. I don't know what would have happened to me if you hadn't saved me. I didn't even realize he and my little bitches pulled the old trick with drinks and sneaking out through the back door on the last call without me. I was supposed to go with them, but they didn't wait for me, they just left. I didn't even hear them call me the last time, so I missed it. Well, over the next couple of years while I worked, Catherine was always by my side, standing up for me. We got to know each other very well and started dating a few months after I saved her. When we finished school, we got married. Catherine is just a little demanding. She loves parties and dancing, enjoys good food, and likes to drink fine wine. Everything's fine. We have great jobs and no kids, so we can afford it. We just can't afford as much as she wants right now, and it frustrates her when I tell her we can't go somewhere until payday. Some of our money arguments revolve around the fact that my parents are quite wealthy. They own a large farming operation and nearly four sections of farmland in our hometown. We also have a large year-round fishing and hunting resort. When I tell Catherine that we can't afford something, she almost always screams that if I weren't such an idiot, I'd get it from my parents. She thinks I should go back home and take over my dad's managerial position so we could make big money and be a big fish in a small pond. I've told her multiple times that I'm here, at this job, to gain some real experience and learn how the big boys do it before I go back to our company. The resort manager plans to retire in just three years, and by then, I'll take his place. But for Catherine, it's not fast enough that I began to receive snide comments about my ability to earn enough to pay our bills. Sometimes Catherine would leave work with her friends and come home battered. Many times over the past few months, I had to pick her up or pay for a taxi. About five months ago, all of this stopped. Oh, she still came home agitated, and many times I had to go to her office the next day to pick up her car. Sometimes I had to drive her to her favorite bar to get it, but I never had to pay the taxi or pick her up. Once or twice, I found her asleep on the floor in the living room when I came down the next morning. I wondered how she got into the house if she had passed out on the floor behind the door. Finally, after several arguments, I decided to find out what was really going on. I did what many men do in such situations. I bought voice recorders and put them in Catherine's purse, in the car, and even one in her office, hidden under the desk. I listened to our landline phone and bought the necessary equipment to copy her mobile calls, what I learned killed my love for her. She was having a sexual affair with one of the men she worked with. 
Many late nights and Saturday shopping trips with the girls over the past five months have been her liaisons with the old good-for-nothing Gregory Anders. He was one of those obnoxious salesmen you hate. Greg was arrogant. He had a slick smile and ingratiated himself with his best. His only salvation, or perhaps not, was that not only was he the highest paid salesman in her company, but also his father owned the damn place that I had enough recordings to understand two things. When I cut down on our visits to expensive restaurants, reduced the number of entertainments, stopped buying exquisite wines, going to expensive shows, and so on, Catherine complained loudly and persistently at work about how badly I treated her. Gregory noticed that Catherine was unhappy and began to watch the women during their nightly walks. He spent money, bought them drinks, and generally showed them a good time until he caught Catherine's interest. After that, he managed to persuade her to meet him for lunch at a fancy bistro. Once she was hooked on his extravagance, he invited her to dine after work in luxurious establishments. After a few weeks, Catherine succumbed to his charms and began to spend time in bed with Gregory. He started giving her orders, and, to my shock, she obeyed them. All he had to do was threaten to stop his generosity, and she complied with his demands. I even had recordings of him telling her to cut down on the amount of sex we were having because he didn't want my sloppy seconds. He told her that she needed to make sure that at least 24 hours had passed between sleeping with me and sleeping with him, otherwise he would dump her. He said, I refuse to have sex with my woman after she's been with someone lesser. I don't care how you do it, but you need to make sure you're clean before coming to me. Our sex life quickly declined and revolved around old good Gregory's trips out of town for sales and on Sundays. He was never with her on Sundays, so it quickly became my only guaranteed day of love. I must admit I really didn't care once I found out what was going on. I kept that cheating bitch around as long as I could, only because I was preparing for a divorce. Luckily, we had only been married for about 27 months, and we didn't have any kids yet when I found out about old good Greg and Kate, she can't stand being called Kate, so that's how I think of her now. We rented a pretty nice apartment and bought two new cars. Of course, she had to have a BMW. I was quite happy with my 2010 F-150 Super Crew 4x4, which I bought new when we finished college, when we went somewhere, she refused to ride in that damn old truck and insisted we take her car. Of course, we rarely go anywhere together now. I just do enough with her to keep her in the dark. Today begins my revenge on Kate and Greg. She has a date with him tonight. She's scheduled to meet him at the mall at 6.30 in the evening. They're going to have drinks and then dinner at the new French restaurant. After that, they're going dancing. She told me she's meeting up with the girls for a baby shower party. Kate stepped out of the shower at 5.30 and began to dress. She was ready to leave by 6. That was just enough time for her to get to the mall and meet Greg. I waited in the hallway by the door of our bedroom until she emerged. I barged into the room and enveloped her in my arms. I kissed her and began to caress her. Damn it, Dave, stop it. You know I need to meet the girls at 6.30. I don't have time for this, and besides, you'll mess up my makeup. Sorry, darling. I just need you so badly. How about a quickie now, and then we can really go at it when you get back home? No. I don't have time, Dave. I pushed her back until her legs hit the edge of the bed. I already knew she was wearing thigh-high stockings and bikini panties. When her legs touched the bed, she fell backward, and I leaned over her. Damn, I was going to miss this pussy that I really needed this release, and I wanted to make sure she got the full load that I kissed her and stepped back. She yelled about how I messed up her makeup and how now I've dirted her. She headed to the bathroom to fix herself up, but I grabbed her and dragged her to the door and down the hallway. As we passed by the table where she kept her purse, I picked it up and handed it to her. Sorry for taking so long, darling, I said. Though I really needed it. Thank you. Here's your purse. If you hurry, you can still make it and not be late. Say hi to the girls for me. You can blame me for making you late. 
Tell them I apologize. But I need to freshen up. I can't go into town looking like this. No, you're fine, darling. We've done it often, remember. No one will ever know. Now go and have fun, baby. Kate glared at me and turned to her car. That was all I could do not to laugh. I sat, waiting for the recording to see what the jerk thought about getting her dirty that night. Oh, guys, he was mad at Kate. I heard them kissing and moaning as they entered his apartment. There was a lot of rustling sounds, then I heard Kate say, Greg, darling, I'm sorry, but Dave made me make love to him before I left. Let me go clean up before we get into bed. What? I told you not to let that little bastard near you. I heard a slap, and Kate screamed. Now drag your ass to the bathroom and freshen up. I couldn't hear anything else because Kate had apparently left her purse in the living room, and they were fucking in the bedroom, but inside, I was happy. I had angered old Greggy, and judging by the sound, maybe he even slapped Kate. I didn't see a bruise, so I assumed he just gave her a slap, the next two times I knew Kate was going to be with Greg, I made her sleep with me. In fact, every time she left the house, I made sure to leave a load in her in case she was really going to meet Greg, rather than doing the innocent thing she told me she was doing, Greg was getting angrier and angrier. He called her a cheater and other horrible names. Almost every time she cried before he roughly took her. It was so cool. I would sleep with her and she would leave the house crying in fear of Greg, then he would be rude to her and yell at her and she would cry even more. As far as I know, he hasn't hit her again since that first time, and I suspect it was just an ass spanking, although the last time she was with Greg was bad. I had had enough, and I decided that my revenge was over. I arranged everything to hand her the divorce papers during her Saturday date. I even provided Greg's wife with copies of the recordings and photos I had. No, I didn't have photos of them engaging in dirty deeds, only of them dining, dancing, and kissing in his car. That was enough. I paid extra for Kate to be serviced after they reached his apartment in the city. It was actually an apartment rented by his father's company for corporate visitors. Both Greg and his father used it for their affairs with women they weren't married to. Oh yes, I was also enough. Oh, yes, I was also kind enough to send Greg's mother photos of his father and his secretary fooling around. Damn, why not be a good guy? The staff greeted Greg and Kate in the condominium lobby. After he serviced her, he handed Greg a letter that I prepared for him. The server processing said to Greg, I was instructed to deliver this letter to you, Mr. Anders. Mr. Stevens outlined his actions to you so that you know what has been happening in the past few months and what you can expect when you return home next time. In the letter, I explained what documents I had against him and Kate, and that I provided them to his mother and his wife. I also asked him if he enjoyed getting my leftovers from Kate. I told him that I made sure that every time she went to him, I sent him a piece of myself so he could play with it that I'm afraid Greg got so angry that he hit Kate. He managed to hit her twice before the guard grabbed him and dragged him away. I heard it, and I heard the guard calling the police and an ambulance for Kate. I felt sick. Yes, I wanted to hurt Kate, but I didn't want her to suffer physically. I just didn't know Greg would actually try to beat her. About an hour later, I received a call from the hospital. They wanted me to come, fill out some paperwork, and bring Kate home. I laughed and said, excuse me, ma'am. I can't do that. Kate and I are getting divorced, and she doesn't live with me. Why don't you call her lover and ask him to pick her up? Oh. Well, I suppose I can do that. What's his name? I gave her Greg's name and phone number. She paused for a moment, then said, um, sir, I'm sorry, but I can't call Mr. Anders. Your wife is in the emergency department because Mr. Anders beat her badly tonight. I believe he's in jail now, sir. Okay, here are two more phone numbers. Maybe one of them can help. I gave Kate's parents phone numbers and one of her two best friends. I don't know who picked her up. I hadn't heard anything about her for almost four days. 
On Wednesday evening, I left work and found Kate waiting for me by my truck. When she saw me, she slowly got out of her car and approached me, Kate had tears in her eyes as she stood before me. David, darling, she said. Can we please talk about everything? Please. No, Kate. There's nothing much to talk about. You cheated, and I caught you. Now we're getting divorced, I said. But I don't want a divorce, Dave. Can't we just end this? I have nowhere to go. Please, I need to come back home. I promise I'll do better if you just let me come back home and let me make it up to you. No, that's not going to happen, darling. I heard Greggy had to move into your little love nest. Why don't you move in with him and his daddy? I bet they'd be happy to take care of you. I walked around Kate and got into my truck. As I closed the door, she stood there crying. She didn't move until I was out of sight and now another thing I didn't understand about women. Kate worked full-time and made almost $36,000 a year. Why didn't she have enough money to rent a place like me? Why did she move into that damn apartment with Greg and his father? I don't know. What I learned from the police report is that Greg and his father beat her so badly that she died after three days in the hospital. She obviously angered them when she refused to let them both have sex with her. She thought she was Greg's mistress, and they would get married after the divorce, according to the statement she gave to the police before her death, now I really feel like shit. Kate destroyed our marriage in search of a better life. I killed Kate with my stupid revenge. I raised my eyes and said, bartender, give me another one. I need to end this shit. I floated, and the world spun, and then damn mule kicked me in the head. There were dozens of people standing over me. I peeked under the short skirt of a goddess. She looked down at me. Shock reflected on her face, and she dropped to her knees beside me. David, is that really you? Why the hell are you so drunk that you fell off your bar stool? Patty? Yes, Dave. I would ask how you're doing, but I don't think you're in any condition to tell me. Let's get you up and see if we can sober you up a bit, Patty and one of the bouncers helped me to her booth. She gave me some coffee. I made two trips to the bathroom to get rid of the coffee and most of my insides. Thank God I didn't have to clean up after myself, after a couple of hours, at least I was able to speak without much trouble. Patty demanded an explanation of what I was doing so drunk. I told her the whole story you just read and said, so, you see Patty. I killed her. I don't know what to do now. I hated her for what she did to me, but I didn't want her dead. Patty sat in shock. She stared at me with her mouth open. Finally, she reached out and hugged me tightly. Dave, some of what you did was pretty rotten, but you didn't kill her. That bastard Greg killed her. You couldn't have known he would do that. Patty sat for a while, staring into the distance, then said, You know, Dave, I'm partly to blame for this too. Now I regret never telling you about Catherine when we were in college. Even after you started dating her, she had her eye on other guys. If they had a lot of money or none at all, and they were willing to spend it on her, she'd sleep with them. Often in the evenings, when she wasn't spending time with you at Joe's, she was out with some guy with deep pockets. How do you think she afforded all that expensive clothing she wore? I never told you because back then you weren't exceptional, and I really didn't think you'd fall for her tricks and marry her. Damn it, you worked at Joe's and knew the kind of scoundrels who hung out there. I thought you were just chasing after her for sex, like other guys. So, you see, I'm also somewhat to blame that I sat and looked at Patty. Even in college, huh? Damn, I just don't understand women. I thought we were doing okay. Dave, don't paint all women with the same brush. You know, many of us aren't like that. If you apply those criteria, I suppose I should run away from you, because all men are like Gregory, right? Dave, I know that's not true. I've worked with you for two years. I know what kind of person you are. 
How many women have you brought home and tucked into bed when they were so drunk that they could have been raped if someone hadn't taken care of them? Dave, you just need to understand that women are like men. There are good, decent players, and there are not. There are female players, just like there are male players. Look for the good ones and do what you can. We think differently than men, that's true, and we're more guided by emotions, but it's not that hard to understand, is it? Patty smiled and took me by the hand. Let's go, Dave. Let me take you home. By the way, where do you live? If you're really interested in learning something about women, when all this settles down, I'll give you a few lessons on how to understand them. Okay. What are your thoughts on OP? Thank you for joining us in our tales where revenge is served piping hot. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more stories that guarantee your satisfaction. Stay tuned for the next one to satisfy your appetite for revenge. If you're under 18, brace yourself. It's not for the faint-hearted.